That's one thing that never fails, that never gives up, never runs out on you, never changes, and that's the love of God. Aren't we thankful for that? That God does not change like shifting shadows, that he is the father of lights, that he is the creator, and he's not a fad and he doesn't go out of style. But I thought I'd have a little fun with you this morning with some trivia. Now, for those of you who weren't around in the the 80s, this is going to be like a a deer in headlight moment for you. But for the others of you, you may fall on the floor laughing at some of these things. Okay, so I'm going to say a line, and you're going to give me the name of the restaurant or the place or the tagline, whatever it is. Are you ready for this? Okay, here we go. Where's the beef? I knew you could do it. Have it your way. Kind of like some people's theology, right? Have it your way. Ooh, maybe I shouldn't have said that. (laughs) That's pretty good. Okay, now this will take you back a little ways, okay? Just remember about wearing something around your neck. I've fallen and I can't get up. Life alert or life call. Okay, do you remember the lady's name? Mrs. Fletcher. We're sending someone now, Mrs. Fletcher. Yes, anyway, sorry about that. If your last name's Fletcher, we do have some Fletchers, don't we? Yes, I thought you'd like that. Okay, see if you get this one. Now, this is more of a little song. See if you get the fast food place. Big Mac, filet fish, quarter pound of french fry, ice cream, sundae, apple pie. <laughs> McDonald's, good. So I thought we would go back a little bit and uh, show you a clip from one of those 80s commercials. And let's just enjoy. We're ready. It certainly is a big bun. It's a very big bun. Big fluffy bun. It's a very big fluffy bun. Where's the beef? Some hamburger places give you a lot less beef on a lot of bun. Where's the beef? At Wendy's, we serve a hamburger we modestly call the single. And Wendy's single has more beef than the Whopper or Big Mac. At Wendy's, you get more beef and less bun. Hey, where's the beef? I don't think there's anybody back there. You want something better. You're Wendy's kind of people. So I'm hoping next week when we have our cookout and have all the first responders here that we have a little more beef than that, hopefully on the burgers. We'll, we'll make sure of that. Help right hospitality team. You know, there seems to be nothing in the world that's safe from change. I mean, really, you used to go to a hamburger joint and you would get a hamburger. And that's pretty much what you would get, a hamburger, fries, and a drink. And now places serve salads and they serve... You know, all kinds of ice cream, which is not a bad thing. All kinds of different selections on the menu. They're digital menus, and they confuse you, and you get to the drive-thru, and you're overwhelmed, and right away you get to the drive-thru, they're like, may I help you? Can I take your order? You know? And, and maybe you get to the drive-thru, and you're just so overwhelmed, and the reason you're in the drive-thru is because you need to get out fast. You have got a lot going on, but the drive-thru... It's not fast food anymore, is it? At least the service is not fast for most places. And so you may be like Karen's brother back in, you know, back in the 80s. He had a lot going on and had a bunch of friends with him on a Friday night. And they went through, I believe it was a Wendy's drive-thru. And they got up to, you know, the the drive-thru, the order there. And the young lady said, may I help you? And Karen's brother pauses for a moment. He says, yeah, I just need somebody to talk to. And you can imagine the little attendant didn't know what to do. She was probably in a daze. Uh, 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 let me talk to my manager, you know. I know that's kind of funny, but maybe that's what we do need. Maybe we need somebody to talk to. But it is for certain things are changing all around us, folks. We grow taller and we grow wider. Our hair turns gray or it falls out. Our athletic abilities And mental faculties, they begin to slip away. Those six-pack abs now morph into a spare tire, you know? Especially during the football season, and I won't go any farther than that. We get wrinkles. Our teeth fall out. Even our most treasured relationships change. Best friends get transferred. Our kids grow up and move away. The fact remains that everything changes except God. Only God is unchanging. God is not rebranded. He does not evolve. He does not grow old and fall apart. He does not move away. He's the same yesterday, today, and forevermore. And when everything else in life is unstable, it gives us great comfort to know that God will not change. 
He's the same today as he was at creation. What security that provides. Folks, God is our constant security and foundation. As James reminds us in James 1.17, every good and perfect gift comes from above, from the Father of lights, who does not change like shifting shadows. He remains forever constant, forever the same. There used to be a for him song. Maybe you've heard of it. It says, he never changes. He's always, he's always the same, forever constant. His love has no end. He never changes. He's always, he's always the same. Never changes. He's always the same. You know, you might see your shadow at times, and we had a problem with that a while back and kind of do now with the white wall. You see your shadow, and your shadow may show you being tall or skinny or maybe wide or just not looking like you, you know? It's different. And then your driver's license, I'm not asking you to pull it out, but, you know, if you were to look at your driver's license, you'd be like, oh, gosh, Man, that looks awful. What happened to me? You know? And you're stuck with it. Five, 10, 20 years. And that's the way it is. That's the snapshot of you at that particular moment. But as soon as you get that driver's license picture taken, within a month or two months, you're already changing. Things are different. Everything around you is changing. And it's hard to keep up. As we look at God's vision, the world, and that's the series we're in right now, God's vision. Last week, last two weeks was the church. Now we're moving into the world. I want you to hear this. I don't know how many churches are preaching and teaching this. I, I really don't. But my hunch is not very many are preaching this. But I'm going to preach it. Let's be reminded that Christianity does not progress with the times the culture, new doctrines, politics, social issues, life choices, and the list goes on and on. Let me say this. If Christianity did progress with the times, it would be a false religion. Now, I want to say this. The Word of God never changes. It remains forever the same. Never changes. Now, how we present the Word of God, the methods, it's a little different you know, the way we do that nowadays, the way we teach and preach, you know, we've got all kinds of enhancements now that enable us to do that. You can have all kinds of versions of the Scripture on your phone if you desire to have that, okay? But despite that, that Word of God, the gospel, the truth, does not progress. It does not change. We don't mess with that. And I want you to hold on and I want you to understand why. Do not be deceived into thinking there is a progressive form of Christianity. You hear people saying that, progressive Christianity, progressive churches. There's no such thing as that, in my opinion, based on what I know of God's Word and based on what the Holy Spirit has revealed to me. There is not a progressive form of Christianity. It doesn't exist because the truth never changes. The truth never changes. Somebody's saying, man, why are you preaching this today? Everybody's gone. It's your responsibility to share this message with everybody that's gone and everybody else. They need to hear this message because this is not Stephen Street's message this is a holy inspired message from the Holy Spirit. So keep listening with the ears of your heart, if you would. So as a reminder, Jesus is the same today and forever. Listen to these words from the prophet Jeremiah that Melissa read for us. My people are lost sheep. Their shepherds have led them astray and caused them to roam on the mountains. They wandered over mountain and hill and forgot their own resting place. Is that not relevant for today? Absolutely. It could be written right now for today. Humanity, past, present, future, 
infected and broken by terminal sin sickness, has been on this vision quest to find God. Truth, love, life, purpose, meaning. But as the old song says, we're looking for love in all the wrong places. We are like sheep. We have each gone astray. Each of us has turned to our own way. And we found ourselves in a place of compounding brokenness and lostness. Some people in that place of desperation found themselves crying out in the words of Carolina Liar's song. Show me what I'm looking for. Here's, we're not going to play that song this morning. Last week we had a nice little uh, secular music time together. But I want you to hear the words of this song, and maybe you can search it up later on YouTube and listen to Carolina Liar. The song is, Show Me What I'm Looking For. Save me, I'm lost. Oh, Lord, I've been waiting for you. I'll pay any cost. Just save me from being confused. Wait, I'm wrong. I can do better than this. I'll pay any cost. Save me from being confused. Show me what I'm looking for, oh, Lord. You see, we Christians have been on the same vision quest and we're some of the same people who came to the end of ourselves and cried out to the Lord. We have. We've cried out to Him. Show me what I'm looking for. Show me my purpose. Show me your plan. Show me your ways. Show me what your will is for me, Lord. But you see, we as Christians, we've met the author of the story. We've met the creator and the source of it all. We have come to find truth, love, life, meaning, purpose in a word. And that word is a name. The name above all names. And that's Jesus Christ. He is our purpose. He is our strength. He is love. He is life. He is truth. He is the meaning. It's Jesus In a sense, after all these years, we're just now waking up and coming alive. As the Lord instructs and commands, we now have the privilege and responsibility to grow up into the truth, love, and life and share it with the world. We are to be conformed to the source and represent Him wherever we are in all we do in thought, word, and deed. We're to be conformed to Him. Not to the pattern of this world, but to Him. To have our eyes fixed and focused on Him. He's the author. He's the creator. He's the perfecter. He's the pioneer of our faith. That's Jesus Christ. We are to grow in our relationship with the author and tell His love story to the hurting, the broken, and the lost. Here's where we find a breakdown. This is where we find the breakdown in the world today. It is true for many that those living without the Lord are typically their own worst enemy in finding God. Listen to this. They don't come to God because they are determined to live for themselves and do life on their own terms, self-defining, self-serving, and self-ruling. While they want all that the Lord provides, they don't want the Lord... And so spend their lives on this vicious, empty, and destructive journey apart from Him. And then there are others who simply don't know where or how to find God. And still others have been turned off from God, specifically Jesus Christ, by Christians, by the church. While the church knows the source and the way to the answer of the world's desperate vision quest, the world is getting very mixed signals that are not clear, cause confusion, or unnecessarily turn people off, and on some occasions, inappropriately turn people away. I was reminded that we are to see non-Christians with the Lord's eyes of truth and love looking through the lens of Scripture. All people are created by God and for God, by the eternal, for the eternal. All people. Back to Ecclesiastes 3.11. We've been on this passage for three weeks. It tells us this, God has also set eternity in the human heart, yet no one can fathom what God has done from beginning to end. 
Now, when we consider these words from Ecclesiastes along with the words of Jesus from John 17, 3, now this is eternal life, that they know you, the only true God and Jesus Christ, whom you have sent. We recognize that the eternity being talked about isn't just endless time, but rather a state or quality of existence that lasts forever, specifically being in an intimate relationship with God Almighty. As N.T. Wright reminds us, we are created to exist in the thin places, the thin places where heaven and earth connect and they meet. And we're in one of those right now in real time. Since this is what people were designed and created for, there is this built-in longing and need for the eternal in our lives that must be satisfied. It must be. The fulfillment, the satisfaction of this built-in need is our vision quest, our pursuit of the eternal, divine, and all that entails meaning, fulfillment, hope, peace, love, joy, wholeness, freedom. The list goes on and on. This is, if not, the driving force of our lives. But sadly, many people's vision quest takes them to places and experiences they were never meant for, looking for love in all the wrong places. I need attention. I need affirmation. I need to fit in. And I'll do whatever I need to do to fit in to be in the in crowd, to be accepted, to be popular, to be cool, not to be looked at as a prude. I'll do whatever and hope it'll make me feel good at the same time. It's kind of the attitude of people today, what I'm observing. You see, this longing for eternity, this longing to fill the void in us, it must be satisfied. And the longer it goes unmet, the more desperate a person becomes to find it. And folks, desperation is powerful and it's dangerous, very dangerous. Like a mad thirst, it can empower us to press on in pursuit of that one truth that will alone truly satisfy. Or, like so many in the world today, it can tempt us to consume anything that looks or sounds good, even if it injures us harms us, or could kill us. Satisfying that carnal appetite. Sadly, with humanity all defined and directed by the same sin sickness as Satan himself, we all want what God made us for and offers, but on our own terms. For many, this vision quest takes them to the pursuit of success or pleasure or comfort or wealth or fame or power or safety. Again, the list goes on and on. We try to quench this eternal thirst with the temporal things of this world and always find ourselves still thirsty, empty, and broken and depraved by this quest and wanting more and more and more and more and more. Have we not forgotten the desperate condition of the world, why the world is the way it is in the first place, always wanting more, 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 hungry, can't be satisfied. No Snickers doesn't do it. No drug will do it. No drink will do it. Nothing you watch will do it. No person will do it. Do we recognize that people hunger only for one thing? And they don't even know it. It's the one who created them, molded them, shaped them in their mother's womb. That is the one that fills the vacuum, the void, the emptiness, the addictions. It's God himself and his word. But when you mess with it, when you compromise it, when you piecemeal it, then it's not the same. And then you'll live that life going back and forth never really balanced, never really solid, never really secure, always anxious, always sad, always depressed, and always wanting more. And moving on to the next thing as fast as you can. The next thing. What's next? 
Who will receive me? Who will accept me? What can I get from them? That sort of thing. It's the me, myself, and I selfish or self-righteous state of mind. And that's the state of mind. That's not the heart. My heart, and I hope your heart does too, belongs to the Lord. And if your heart belongs to the Lord, then your mind, your strength, your soul, everything that you are belongs to him. And we do not tarnish his temple. We have been bought with a price. We are the temple of the most high God. And what we do, what we say, how we use this body, how we use this tongue, it does matter, folks. And the only one we need to please and gratify is God. Nobody else. Just God. And he loves you and he accepts you for who you are. But he has greater plans to prosper you, not to harm you, plans to give you a future and a hope. But I'll tell you this, the mind of the sinful man or woman is death. But the mind of the spirit is life and peace. And don't you want life and peace? Jesus says, I've come to give you a peace that's not of this world. And this world is all kinds of trouble and heartache and pain. But Jesus says, take heart. I've overcome the world and you can too because I live in you through the Holy Spirit. And my Father breathed in my essence into you as you were being conceived. At that very moment, you received the Spirit of God. Let that sink in for just a moment, folks. Have we forgotten the desperate condition of our world right now? Do we see people not as druggies and prostitutes and liars and thieves and homosexuals and gluttons and greedy and adulterers or sloths, but as lost sheep? Do we see them as lost sheep? And what are we doing about it? Do we recognize that they too hunger and thirst and have a vision for love, peace, joy, wholeness, freedom, and life to the full, but they are disoriented from truth and reality, and their quest takes them to places and experiences that are ultimately a destructive perversion of what they're really looking for. A lot of smoke screens out there, folks. They don't know these desires and longings, this need, this vision for something greater comes from God, that he made them for it, and he made it for them. He made all people for it. It's his vision planted in the hearts of every human being. Back to Ecclesiastes 3.11 again. And he alone is the source of salvation. He alone is the path and the vision quest fulfillment. But how about Paul with these words from Romans 10 a few weeks ago? This was our passage, and and Karen and the worship team led us in a song called How Beautiful. Matter of fact, I don't believe we sang. I think we were so mesmerized by the words that were based off Romans 10, verses 14 and 15, that we were overwhelmed in a beautiful way. Listen to these words. But how can they call on him to save them unless they believe in him? And how can they believe in him if they have never heard about him? And how can they hear about him unless someone tells them? And how will anyone go and tell them without being sent? This is why the scripture says, How beautiful are the feet of the messengers who bring good news. As we prepare for Holy Communion today, This is all about good news. The ultimate example of sacrificial love. Folks, Jesus didn't die on the cross so that we could toy around with his word and his father's plan. He didn't suffer that horrible, horrible death, the crucifixion and the mocking, so that we could mock his word. He smelled it and make it fit us and our culture and our circumstance. You see, we are to stand on the solid rock, the foundation of God's Word, and not let it be watered down, not compromise it, not change it in any way. For me, as your pastor, to do any of that would be blasphemous. But yet, it seems to be more and more accepted in our culture and in the Christian culture. Pastors and mega churches 
opening their doors because they want to fill every single seat, every single spot online. I could say a lot about that, but I'm not to judge that. Really, you're not either. But instead of judging, I'll let God do that because that's his job. He's the sovereign one. But I will hold true to what God has called me to do, to preach and to teach. And that's his word. And pardon the French, but I'm not going to screw around with it, folks. I'm going to preach it and teach it the way that it is. Inspired from the Holy Spirit. Not Stephen Street, not a bunch of other books and commentaries, but from him, the source of of all of creation. So as we come to this table this morning, I want us to pray. I'm not going through the full Holy Communion liturgy this morning, but this prayer that I first heard from a devotion called the Wake Up Call is one that I want to lead you through this morning to be in Holy Communion. So if you would just lift your hands up to receive and repeat these words after me. Lord Jesus, I come to your table. I'm hungry. I'm thirsty for more of you. Lord Jesus, I am your witness. I come to you today to receive your righteousness and release my sin. I receive your wholeness and release my brokenness. I receive your fullness and release my emptiness. I receive your creativity and release my chaos. I receive your healing and release my sickness. I receive your joy and release my despair. I receive your rest and release my striving. Come, Holy Spirit. Transform my heart. Transform my mind. Transform my soul and my strength so that my life becomes your sanctuary. Breathe on me, breath of God. Fill me with life anew. For the glory of God, my Father, my Savior, my best friend.